Hey, what's up everyone? Pastor Mike here from Time of Grace. So excited to have you with us for another month of Behind the Series, a podcast where we dig into the upcoming sermon series here on Time of Grace. Uh, Super excited, not just uh, me here today, some of you are listening, some of you are watching, but once again, back, our favorite friend, Amber L.B. Swenson. Thanks for being here, Amber. (laughs) You're welcome. Good to be here. Yeah, we've been filming a bunch of stuff today and it's been going perfectly. Yeah, let's go with that. We, we're we're going to go with are that. Are we editing out the false testimony? <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to back up to make sure the lightning didn't come out of the sky. <laughs> Our producer is a lot like Jesus. She patience. erases the bad parts of what oh. we do. <laughs> so only the good I was going to say patience to the core. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank so, God for editing. So super special, not just to have Amber here today, but for us to be in the same room. So we're not on a Zoom call like we normally are because we live, uh, what, a state or two away. So Amber, tell our friends why you're here Uh, in Appleton, Wisconsin today. Yeah, I'm here to do some shoots for for upcoming challenge grants and I have a book coming out in a month, but we're not going to talk about that yet. We got to stay tuned. We'll talk about that next time. It's so good. Make sure you check out next month's podcast. Yeah, we're diving into a series this month. It's called Hard Words, Loving Truths. It's just a quick series on the little book of Jude in the New Testament. So what do you think? Should we dive in? I think we should. Let's do it. So tell us about the big idea. Yeah, I'd say the big idea of the book of Jude is that there's these two key teachings in the Bible, the hard teaching about God's law, obedience, holiness, and then this really tender, beautiful, loving teaching of the gospel and mercy and forgiveness. And I think the temptation for Christians, depending on where you come from, what generation you live in, what culture, is to pick one at the expense of the other. So either it's you know all about obedience, holiness, And you lose sight of the unconditional love of God. Or, and I think this is probably the modern American problem, you're so aware of the unconditional love of God that you almost behave like holiness and repentance aren't real things. Mm -hmm. And what I see in the book of Jude is uh, what we think is Jesus' half-brother Jude realizing like, I'd really love to talk about the mercy and grace stuff, but right now you guys need to hear about this stuff because you've forgotten it. So there's this passage, uh, this is uh, Jude, just one chapter book, verse 3. It says, Dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, salvation, truth two, I felt compelled to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to God's holy people. So Jude's like this pastor who says, I'd love to talk to you about mercy and forgiveness and salvation, but right now I got to talk to you about this because you got to fight for the true Christian faith. It's almost the parent concept. You know, I think you bring that out in your sermon too. Hmm. Like you want to be the fun parent yeah. and just focus on, hey, we're going to have fun. Yeah. But when you look at your kids' lives, you're like, eh, we got to work on this a little too. <laughs> yeah. Which is fair. I mean, we yeah. all need it, right? Yeah, that's so true. We know that as parents, it's certainly true for Christians too. Yeah. Hmm. Not, yeah, not just children too, <laughs> but yeah. parents too. Yeah. yeah. The first sermon is called Two Dangers That Slip Into Christianity. Hmm. The first danger you talk about is grace is a reason to sin. Hmm. And this false teaching is still alive and well today. Yeah. What are some of the lies that we, we're talking to Christians here, not people of the world, sure. still fall into concerning our sin? Yeah. I wrote down two answers to that question, but I want to ask you first. As you think of like modern Christian, you know, we're Bible people, what kind of half-truths, deceptions do you think have crept into our generation when it comes to the faith? I think that we sort of um, rate sins. Like as as long as rate you... Rate them? Like rank? Rate the, rank, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. Like as long as you do the acceptable sins, you're mm. okay. But if you do one of the bad sins, then you're not. Ooh. Does that make sense? Yeah, give me so an example. Like, what's acceptable and what's not? So um, as we were talking about before, like gluttony. We're Americans. No, let's let's cut this part. Uh, it's making me, <laughs> the G making word you a little nervous. Me. <laughs> right away. Yeah. But truthfully, we're we're Americans, so we say, "I can buy another shirt. I can buy another outfit. I have extra money. I can get the shoes, or it mm. tastes good, so I'm going to go to the buffet and I'm going to totally indulge, even if I was full 20 minutes ago. Mm. I'm at a buffet. Yeah, I can." I can be okay sinning in this way Hmm. because it's an acceptable Christian sin. Interesting. But don't commit adultery Hmm. because that's an unacceptable Christian sin. Interesting. Gossip. Um, That's one of the things that I think people say all the time. I mean, it's true. Hmm. 
I mean, I wouldn't be telling you if this isn't true. Mm. So it doesn't matter if you are, yeah. you know. Don't be mad. It's true. Right. Like, wait, wait, wait. But maybe I shouldn't have told you, but just so you know, yeah. I mean, so-and-so. Sure. Because it's true. Wow. That it's acceptable instead of saying, hey, would, yeah. would God want us to be saying that? So I think that's where Christians especially fall into not taking our sins seriously. Yeah. So acceptable sins, that'd be a good book title, I think. You know, we think of the seven deadly sins. Sometimes I wrote a book people on use that. that phrase. Did you know that for a time of grace? I think I did. Yeah, okay. Just seven wondering. acceptable sins, maybe <laughs> no. what we, we downplay in the Christian yeah. church. Yeah, my answer to your question. So you asked about, you know, what lies do church people believe? Uh, to me, there's this really narrow biblical road between these two really common ditches, two lies. One is that sin isn't that bad. Like the Bible says the wages of sin is death. You could keep all the rules, but if you stumble at one point, that's James 2.10, you're guilty of breaking all of it. And I think most people would say, well, it's not that bad. It's not like one thing I did is going to lose my place. It's not that bad. Or the Bible saying, you know, put sin to death. Like fight it, choke it out, pin it down. That's Colossians chapter 3. Put whatever belongs to your earthly nature, put it to death. And I think most of us would say, well, I mean, it's not that, it's not that bad. So I think there's kind of a shrug your shoulders, hey, we're human, nobody's perfect. Yeah. But like going to spiritual battle, whether you're an impatient parent or a person trying to get their way all the time in a relationship or holding a grudge against your enemies or being mm -hmm. sexually immoral. So there's one lie. It, it's not that bad. They got to like fight it day after day after day. And I think the, the corollary lie is it's so bad. Yeah. It, it's so bad that God couldn't possibly accept me. What I did was so bad, un, unexcusable, so evil and wrong that God couldn't look at me and smile. I couldn't really be forgiven. I couldn't really make it to heaven. Or I really couldn't change this. It's so yeah. bad. So I mean, just a little, a little tweak. I, I sometimes think the devil is at first the great excuser. It, it's fine. Yeah. And then once you do it, he becomes the great accuser mm -hmm. and says, how could you do that? Like you got to live the rest of your life with a guilty conscience because of that one thing that you did. Yeah. So I, I think the Bible gets us to this really narrow middle road of like fight sin with everything you have to love God with your whole heart. And then if by chance you do sin, just remember you have a really great Savior who takes yeah. care of not just the acceptable ones but the, the worst of them. Really, if we just focus on the cross, right? That keeps us in the middle yeah. because if we say sin isn't that bad but we look at the cross, look yes. at what Jesus endured. Or if we say, well, I'm pretty, or, you know, I'm so bad, mm -hmm. look at the cross, Jesus took care of it, it mm -hmm. is finished. So mm -hmm. either way, if we look at the cross, that's sort of going to keep us in that, yep. that middle out of the ditch. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Jesus is suffering and dying. It's, it's not that bad. Like, <laughs> no. what? Like, yeah, you would, bad. you would grieve the depth of your yeah. sin. And then to say it's so bad, he's like, no, 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 it's yeah. finished. So, yeah. What, what is so, you just said in 15 seconds what it took me <laughs> 15 minutes to explain. Once um, in a while, a miracle comes out of my mouth. Hey. <laughs> Jude's, Jude's examples include many, many people who you said to and used his words, followed their own desires. Mm -hmm. And that's a big deal today. Mm. You do you. Mm -hmm. God made you this way. What's the problem with this ideology creeping into the church? Yeah. I'm raising daughters, so I'm aware of like the media they pay attention to, the musicals we see, the songs on the radio, the plots of animated movies. And there's probably no higher value in modern culture than being true to yourself. Mm. The problem, I don't think anyone actually believes that. Like how could you look, if I, if I had a friend who was racist and he says, I don't know, I've just always... I just grew up feeling this way. Yeah. Would I ever say to a racist person, you do you? There's a guy who came to my church once who said, I, I, I didn't choose it, Pastor, but I've always been attracted to underage people. Would I say, like, well, who am I to judge? You do you. Be true to yourself. I would never say that because that's wrong. Yeah. I never, I don't think, remember, chose to be overly competitive, to yell at referees, to boast about my accomplishments. Do you want me to be boastful and arrogant? I don't think so. So it's, it's so deceiving to me. Like, who would ever believe that if they gave it 10 seconds of thought? Yeah. We, we don't want the world to just do what it feels or do what comes naturally. 
So the the excuse that I didn't choose it, God made me this way,、mm. we wouldn't accept it for racists. We wouldn't accept it for immoral people. If you're married and your spouse says, "Hey, I'm just attracted to lots of people," right? You would never say, "Well, hey, honey, you do you." It's all good. No, we. I think all of us kind of know that there's some outside standard that's good,、mm. and we impose it on people whether they feel it naturally or not. And so, yeah, to, to me, it's it's really deceptive. It's flattering. Because it doesn't cost me anything to just be true to my own feelings, but I think we just got to be honest. Like you, you don't live by that. You don't parent by that standard. You don't want your neighbor or your political enemies、yeah. to live by that standard. So、right. why, why would we accept that for us? That's interesting. Because even like garbage day, they have standards. You have to have it out by this time, or it's not、mm. going to be picked up.、Mm-hmm. You know. So the garbage company doesn't say, "Hey, you do you."、Sure. Put the garbage out whenever you want. And we'll come by whenever it works for you. Have it your way. Have it your way. City ordinances are <laughs>、no. not like, hey, park wherever you want, any time、mm-hmm. of the day ever. Yeah. So you're right. The, all of society is built on there have to be parameters. Yeah. And yet somehow we are so attracted to, hey, you do you. Yeah. It, it reminds me, you know, when someone says, well, you, Jesus told us not to judge. You don't. Let's say I'm. I don't approve of your relationship. And you say, well, Jesus told us not to judge. In that very sentence, you are judging me for the way that I'm treating you. Yeah, it's like, well, you don't live by that. You judge people all the time.、That's、you see someone,、oxymoron. you see someone、yeah. like yelling at their little kid. And you're like, that's a bad parent. You're judging, like all of us judge all the time. All of us have an outside standard. So we've just gotten to this weird spot where I think, you know, if you hear something enough times, it sounds true. Yeah, yep. It, it must be true because I saw it in this movie and this show, and my buddy said it, and、mm. I saw this on social media, but. I think we just got to be honest that no, no one operates by that standard in life, and there really is an outside standard. And I think the question is, whose outside standard are we going to choose? Right. And if you really want to come combat the you do you, read the Book of Judges. I just finished、mm-hmm. that in my small group、yes. Bible study, and almost every chapter starts the same. In those days, there was no king. Everybody did what they wanted. Yes. And then it goes on to, and this、well? is why it stunk. <laughs> it was bad. And throughout the book of Judges, it goes from bad、yeah. to bad.、Yeah. Like the last chapter, you don't even want to read. Yeah. Because it's so bad, and it keeps saying, and everybody was doing, everybody was doing you. Yes. Like you do you, however you feel like you want to do it. So go to the book of Judges, and yeah, yeah. you don't want to do you anymore. Yeah. What a great example. Yeah.、Hmm. All of this comes down to the second point, which is whether or not you realize it. When you live, you do you.、Mm-hmm. I'm this way. You're really saying Jesus isn't Lord.、Mm. So how does holding on to our sin strip Jesus of his lordship? Yeah. So my kind of working definition of Lord is the one who gets the last word.、Mm. You know, I feel this way. You feel that way. The majority of Americans feel this way. The majority of humans feel this way. Okay, there's some differences in what we feel, what we think. Who gets the last word? Who's the the ultimate authority that gets the final vote? That's the Lord. Yeah. And so we're all faced with. I mean, in my own heart, I naturally feel a whole bunch of things, but the Bible says that's bad.、Mm. So if I say I'm gonna be true to myself, what I'm essentially saying is I I know better than what God has revealed in His Word. Wouldn't that be weird to go up to Jesus and say, "Hey,、uh, oh. thanks for sharing your opinion, Jesus, but let <laughs> let, let me let me human explain to you right now, right? Like, step aside. I, I know I know you're the Son of Man, <laughs>、yeah. but I'm a man, so I'm like, like here's how this works. Yeah. I mean, we would. I, I think lots of people would say that's kind of crazy, but whenever there's a a difference between what I believe and what the Bible endorses, both can't be right if there's a conflict. So who's going to be the Lord? Who's going to、mm. get the last word? That's a That's a question I, not enough of us wrestle with. Am I really ready to say to Jesus that He needs to learn from me?、Hmm. And if I'm not ready to say that,、yeah. then maybe I better be ready to repent, change my mind, and embrace a new set of beliefs. So we just finished Lent, so we're just past Easter now.、Hmm. And I heard, correct me if I'm wrong, that Judas, when he betrayed Jesus, he called him Rabbi instead of Lord or Teacher. Like、hmm. there was a change there、hmm. in how he addressed. Interesting. That. Could note the change in his heart. He was like, "Greetings, Rabbi," instead、uh, of like, "Teacher," not Lord. Huh? So no, I've never dug into that. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, the the names that people called Jesus. I wonder if that. But was that just was, would show a change in his heart. Like he's just a teacher,、yeah. not the Son of God, not the Lord, not、yeah. the Son of Man. He's just a teacher. You're my equal、when、instead of my authority. Right. Huh? So when he betrayed him, it was like,、mm, 
you know, Interesting. that lordship had stepped down. All right. Yeah. I want to pause the podcast and do some <laughs> biblical research. Yeah, but let I'll me know. That. Check back on that. Yeah. I'll save that. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Okay. Sermon number two is a promise for struggling sinners. So we turn the corner. Yep. We went from, you know, hardcore guys, you got to take your sin seriously. Yes. To we're going into that salvation. Yeah. In the book of Jude. And you say early on in this sermon that real Christians repent. repent. Mm -hmm. And I just want to make sure that people understand the difference between confession and repentance. So can you explain that? Yeah. Um, if you don't know the story, if you're watching, um, 500 years ago when Martin Luther started what's called the Protestant Reformation, he nailed like this list of 95 things. They're called the 95 Theses. So the bulletin board of like his his ancient town that he lived in, you know, ninety five things he wanted to talk about. the The number one statement that he made out of those ninety five, have you no, learned I this? Know. He said, "When this was his quote, I think I got it right. When Jesus Christ said repent, he meant that the entire life of a Christian would be one of repentance. So hmm. repenting in the Bible is not a thing I do like attending church." or saying a prayer, or singing a song. Repentance is like a state of being that I constantly live in as a Christian and I never leave. That's, so, that's incredible. Keep going. Yeah. yeah no. Okay, so confession is something I occasionally do. I think the Greek word confess is homologeo, which means to say the same thing. So if I'm saying what I did to you, hey, I lost my cool yesterday, yeah. or man, I was really a jerk to you, I'm sorry, that's confession. Confession comes out of repentance, which is the constant state of me, like, grieving my sin. So, repentance as a Christian means I don't think sin is a joke. Mm. It bothers me. I can't, uh, 1 John 3 says, I can't continue in it. I might have done it, but I can't look back on it and say, I'm so proud, I would have done it again. I know what the Bible says, but I know better. Like, that's a lack of repentance. So, yeah, that little phrase I tried to squeeze in there, real Christians repent, mean, how could, how could you be a real Christian that would not repent? Mm. How could you say, I love Jesus, when I continually love the things that he hates? How could I say, the Holy Spirit's in my heart, when there is no evidence that I love what the Holy Spirit loves? Right? So, there's not a single Christian on planet Earth right now who is unrepentant. They might be mature, they might be immature, they might be strong, they might be weak. Um, when I was 18, I had a, a college doctor in class. My professor, a brilliant guy, said, an unrepentant person says, I sinned. I know the Bible says it's a sin. I'm not sorry that I did it. And if I could repeat it, I'd do it all over again. Yeah. Where a Christian would say either, oh, I didn't know that was a sin. I'm sorry. Or I did it and I really regret it. Yeah. Or I got caught up in the moment. It was stupid. If, if there was a rewind button, I'd be more faithful to Jesus. That's what real Christians say. Those who don't really have faith in their heart might call themselves Christians, but if you're unrepentant, you are not a follower of Christ. That's a huge distinction because the world confesses things all the time. Yeah, I slept with her. Yeah, you know, sure. not sorry about it. Do yeah. it again. Yeah. Or yeah, I got wasted last night. Yeah. Confessing. Yeah. But like you said, the difference in how you view what you did yeah. and where you go from there. Yeah. So some people theologically have just re defined repentance as sorrow. Mm. There's at least some bit of sorrow, some bit of sorry in my heart. Sometimes I feel a lot of it and it brings me to tears. Sometimes it's just the numb, like, oh, why did I do that? But there's not a smile yeah. when I look at my sin and say, oh, yeah, there's no sorrow here. So I, I think you can talk about it in all these different ways, but that's what repentance, that's what real Christianity is. Does the word repent mean to turn? Is that what the actual mean meaning is? Yeah. So there's in the Old Testament, the Hebrew word used for repent is the word shuv, and that means to turn around, right? To do a U-turn. So I was going towards sin, and then I realized, like, oh no, this is bad. So I turned back towards God. Okay. In the New Testament, the word is metanoio, which means to have a change of mind. Okay. Same kind of idea. The reason I turned around with my behavior was because I originally thought, sin is fun. Sin <laughs> is good. This is gonna be a blast. Yeah. And I'm like, oh wait. This is so bad that Jesus had to die for it. I, I can't, I can't love this like I did in the moment. Mm. So my mind changes, my direction changes, and hopefully as a result, the fruit of repentance or my behavior changes too. Thanks for explaining that. Yeah. 
So some people in our circles might not think about repentance much at all. In fact, some people might not think about it except for when they get to church and we go through the confession and then the mm. absolution, which what is absolution? Declaring your forgiveness through Jesus. Okay. So other than that, they might not really think about repenting, mm -hmm. whereas some people actually take this very seriously. Mm. I listened to a podcast by Tim Keller once and he was saying that he sets aside an hour a week mm. for confession and repentance. Yeah. You started this sermon by saying, Pastor Mike loves to sin. <laughs> it's fun. <laughs> it feels good. It's pleasurable. Part of Pastor Mike loves to sin. Yes, I, I know. <laughs> no, well, you made a good point that, I mean, I think if sin wasn't pleasurable and fun, we wouldn't do it. Exactly. It wouldn't be tempting. So, I mean, we all, yep. it's not just you. That was the point that you made. And That's when right. people listen to it, they'll, mm. they'll, they'll recognize it. But in light of that, why should we maybe think about some personal repentance if we don't do that already in our life? Yeah. I think you have to stop and stare at sin for a long time until you really agree that it's that bad. Um, I used to be the chairman of a ministry that helped Christians with pornography. And we had like five steps to recovery from that addiction. And the first step, the second step was get back to God's grace. Mm. But the first step was get real about the wreckage. So if I just say, well, you know, I looked at porn last night. I got to stop and say, no, let, let's talk about this. Like this is yeah. highly addictive behavior. If, you're, if your child walked in on you, I mean, how damaging would that be? If your spouse knew the kinds of bodies you were looking at, how would that affect your life of intimacy and closeness? How much of this is connected to sex slavery and underage people and businesses making money off of people's bodies? Like you have to stop and really think about what that sin does to real people that God loves. And then once you do, it, it hits you. It's not like, well, you know, I'm just a, a human, right? Yeah. Instead, you're like, wow, I, I sinned. This is bad. There's a reason God doesn't like this. And so for so many reasons, you know, it, it is wise. And many mature Christians in the past have taken quality and quantity time to seriously analyze their own holiness and react accordingly. Mm. So I'm not going to change my mind about it unless I see like, wow, this is the enemy. And God's a good father. He wants to save me from this and all its consequences. But if I don't stop and think about the consequences, will I, yeah. will I go to war against this? Or will I just kind of, yeah, I slipped, whatever, and then go back to old behaviors? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, what do you think? In your life as a Christian, have you ever <clears throat> had like a habitual, like systematic way to yeah. deal with your own sin? That's why I read the Bible differently, journaling, hmm. because it definitely brings me to repentance. When I just read through the Bible chapter by chapter quickly, yeah. I really don't think about what it's saying. Hmm. But I was in the book of Matthew, chapter 10, yesterday, and it was talking about whoever acknowledges me before men, I will acknowledge him before my Father in heaven. Hmm. And I was like, God, I have taken credit for your work so many times. Hmm. Wow. Like someone says, hey, Amber, that was a great podcast. I'm like, thanks so much. Hmm. Instead of, whew, you know, the Holy Spirit was speaking through me, sure. yeah. you know, and then I go back. And so when I'm writing that, I write the verse down and I just start saying, God, forgive me yeah. and help me to do better and remind me through great humility, yeah. <laughs> which you do often, yeah. that it is not me yes. who does this. Yeah. If it's going to go well, it will be you working through me. Yes, I love it. So, so you're, yeah, just, you're thinking about a verse instead of just reading it. And doing that, I've done, um, you know, the Psalms, the Proverbs, 1st, 2nd, Peter. Yeah. And um, now I'm in, I'm going through the Gospels and just mm. thinking about these verses. Yeah they often bring you to a state of repentance. If you really look at what yes. God is saying to you in his word yes. you, and think about your life as, you know, the whole Bible as a mirror, yep. you're like, wow, yep, I right stink there. at this, you yeah. know? How much of Christianity, like step one, is just getting in contact with the Bible, going to church, opening your Bible at home. That's just a necessity. Otherwise, you just have your own thoughts. Yep. But then step two, what I hear you saying is, like the, the real secret sauce is not just, well, I went to church, yeah. but you're thinking about it. So whether it's a sermon you're thinking about while you're sitting there instead mm -hmm. of just checking your watch or instead of trying to read, you know, a whole chapter, you're just going to do one paragraph and you're going you're gonna to chew on it a bit. Yeah. Because what I hear you saying is you're just thinking about the words, acknowledge my father, 
Yeah. You're applying it to your own life and it's doing something in your heart. Yeah. And then I have to give you a serious compliment here because the other thing I would say is spend time with Christians. Because after our last Behind the Series podcast, the mm-hmm. very last time, I went up to a Minnesota Wild hockey game. Oh, yes. My daughter, it was her birthday week. And so we took the whole family. And I got a text from our producer, Nia, in the middle of the game. It was in between periods, so it was all good. Okay. And she didn't know we were, I, we were there at all. But it I was all caps. And if you get a, a text from Nia that has all caps, I've you never know gotten that one of these before. Tell me about it. <laughs> you know that something is seriously wrong. So she's like, Amber! Exclamation point, exclamation point. And she's like, I just went to upload your podcast for the week and there's no sound. Oh. And then she took a picture and my mic had no green lights on it. No. So I recorded the podcast. No, it gets better. So I'm like, Nia, it's totally okay. I can re-record it. It's, now, mind you, this is Tuesday and our, you know, yep. someone has to review it. It has yep, to get yep, edited, yep, yep. blah, blah, blah. So I'm like, it's not a big deal. Don't worry about it. And then I'm like, just check the next ones to make sure the mic was working. Oh, no. Four. No. I did the Ten Commandments. No. Four of them. The mic what had no green light. No. Yeah, yeah. No, no I appreciate that reaction oh. because... Once you, you might, check that box, you want to be done. You might not appreciate the work that goes in behind because Nia was like, hey, can you, do you remember what you said? And I'm like, absolutely not. No, like, there's no out. way. Oh, no. It was, it was months earlier that oh, I had recorded oh, it. Oh, oh. And so I'm like, I'm going to have to go back, read the large catechism, take notes, like do the whole thing. Yeah. But I was like, Nia, you know what? God might want to teach me something, hmm. you know, about these commandments. So sure. it's totally okay. Later that week, we got on a Zoom call together and I'm like, I totally credit Pastor Mike for this because there have been so many sermon series, Job, Hmm. the Hills in the Valley sermon that we just talked about last time. And then just talking to you behind the series where you're like, I've asked you the same question in multiple ways. Mm. Like, what about when you're broken? Or what about when you're in pain? Like, mm-hmm. I know you can do that, mm-hmm. like when things are going good, but mm-hmm. what about when you're in the valley? Sure, sure. And you always answer it the same. Like, God is still God. Mm. And he deserves your worship. I remember in the Job series, you're like, you really have a testimony to God when you go to church and you worship yeah. despite the cancer, yes, yes. despite the bad marriage, despite whatever. Wow. And I told Nia, I'm like, you know, I think a year ago, I would have freaked out. Mm. I would have been like, what do you mean? You <laughs> can't be, there's a, that's a lot of work. And I don't, I don't even know if I can do this again. <laughs> Whereas now I'm like, you know what? God has a plan. Sure. And if I did it the first time, he's going to help me through the second time. And yeah, he'll yeah. probably put more truths in my heart. But I totally credited wow. that from just sitting at your feet and learning the lessons. So this is important, huge. Mm-hmm. But then, I mean, we have podcasts and we have Christians mm. available to listen to and yeah. to learn from. Yeah. So thank you for that. Yeah. yeah. Well, you're, that's kind of you. I hear you saying, like, as human beings, there's a good message we need to hear multiple times in multiple ways, maybe for multiple people. Yes. But if we pay enough attention to it, it will produce something good in our life. It'll change your reaction to unexpected things. Yeah. It'll change your attitude towards sin. It'll open your eyes to the bigness of Jesus. Yeah. Which is exactly what Psalm 1 says. Blessed is the person who meditates on the word of God. They're like a tree planted by streams of water that bears its fruit in season. So you're like a walking testimony of that. Yeah. Well, anybody, that's the beauty of it. Anybody can have that. Sure. God doesn't differentiate like, oh, I will give this to Amber. He's like, anybody who comes to me, come to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I will give you the rest. Yes. Yeah, that's so fun. I will make this in your life. If you want to have, you know, a more even keel yeah. and not blow up at everything, sure. like come to me. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll give it to you. you. I'll help you. Yeah. Yeah. That's so awesome. it's for anybody. Boom. Okay. I would love for you to talk to the people who struggle with sin because a lot of people, as you said, they repent mm-hmm. and they think, okay, I'm not going to do that again. Mm. And then a day or two or three days or three weeks or a month later, they're back looking at that porn again. And yeah. then they're like, oh, I, I said I wasn't going to do that and I yeah. don't want to do that and I, or getting drunk again or whatever yep. the, their sin of choice is. Yep. So talk to the people struggling because you made a point in the sermon. Mm. I'm not talking to the people who are struggling, <clears throat> wrestling yes. with sin. Yeah. So what's the difference there? Yeah. Thanks for asking. I said before, real Christians repent. I would also say real saints struggle. Hmm. If you're not struggling, that's my red flag. 
pastorally. Um, but if you still grieve, if it still produces sorrow in your heart after all these times and all these years, that's a sign that the Holy Spirit is still within you. So people get really discouraged. And I suppose we all wish we would have made the right choice on square one. But the fact that I'm just not getting numb to this, yeah. but it still bothers me, it, I, I'm so frustrated why I haven't changed this part of my behavior, that is actually really, incur- that's fruit right there mm. of like a non-Christian who did not love Jesus would not care about this thing. Yes. But you care about this thing because you actually do love Jesus. So if you could see the Bible that's uh, in my, my church office, it's a Bible I've had for 20 years, uh, plus maybe 25, 30 and there's one page especially that is just, I think it's actually disintegrated in the corner because I've flipped this singular page out of, you know, 1,500, 2,000 so many times. And it's uh, Romans chapter 7 where Paul, who's been a Christian, I think for 25 years when he writes Romans, he says, Man, the good stuff I want to do, I don't do it. Mm-hmm. Like I wake up and I say, okay, I'm a, I'm a new guy, I'm a follower of Jesus. And then I get to the end of the day, I'm like, dang, I didn't yeah. check that box. And the stuff that I hate, I said, never again, God, I'm promising you. I went right back to it. So Paul is confessing that struggle. And I would say to people who, who wrestle with that, like, why am I not better than I am? Why am I not a better Christian? Why am I not a better person, spouse, parent, you know, mm. fill in the blank? Like, read Romans 7 because Paul is so honest about that same struggle, but then he gets to like, but I'm not disqualified. Yeah. Who's going to rescue me? And he has an answer. I think he says in verse 24, 25, thanks be to God, mm. you know, through Jesus. And Romans 8, 1, right now there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. So I would say to someone who's struggling with a sin, thank God you're struggling. Like the devil wants to make you numb and cold to that, but you're not. And that's a sign of true Christian faith that still exists in your heart. Mm, that's huge. Yeah. Now you get to the good news. Finally, which is the book of Jude is like... <laughs> punch you in the face for 20-some verses. And then there's just like this little gospel ending, which I appreciate. I loved how you said when you were reading through the tough part, you're like, oh, put your helmet on. <laughs> like, this yeah. is going to hurt a little. Yeah. But then you turn the corner yeah. and you said, God is able to keep us from stumbling and to present us before his glorious presence. Oh. And all throughout this sermon, you mentioned that there are the two camps of people, the people who are stuck in their pride, like, I'm not that bad. Mm-hmm. But then there's another camp of the people who are panicked, which you said before, like, (gasps) I'm really bad. I'm really bad. (laughs) You're like, hey, if you're struggling with your sin. So, because that's where people are like, I I don't know if I'm in. Like, if you're struggling with your sin, Jesus may be pulling you by one foot past the gates of heaven, (laughs) but you're in. So give the assurance to those people who think, and I have to go back to our um, series on abortion. This made me think of our series on abortion because Mm -hmm. some people emailed you Mm -hmm. and I interviewed a woman who for 40 years didn't believe she was forgiven. And you got an uh, email from someone who like 27 years ago had had an abortion and yet they don't believe that that sin is forgiven. So talk to the panicked person today. Yeah. Yeah. Show me a Bible passage that proves that there is an unforgivable sin. Yeah, where, where did Jesus say, I forgive you, except if it was abortion, mm-hmm. adultery, addiction. I've read the Bible a bunch of times in a couple of languages and I haven't found it yet. Yeah. And so to me, like I want to throw that in the face of the devil because he's trying to lie to you. Instead, this little verse in Jude is so beautiful to me. Uh, you quoted part of it. To him, to God, who's able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence, so oh, God's glorious presence, yeah. I love this line, without fault mm. and with great joy. Mm. And Jude breaks out in praise to that God and he says, amen, and the book is over. Without fault. Yeah. So how can you be in the bright light? You know, you and I are in front of uh, lights here that, yeah. you know, <laughs> let's expose <laughs> what we really are. How can you be in the light of God's glorious presence and there's no fault? Um only if Jesus is so good at his job mm. that he makes fallen people faultless. Only if despite my Romans 7 page, which is proof of all of my repetitive sin, Jesus did something so profound for me on the cross that God can actually look at me and his face lights up. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the way the book of Jude ends, it, it's so, I hope people don't close it because it's so tough. 
because those last two verses are like, wow, Jesus is so competent to save real sinners. Yeah. Um, do you know Shane and Shane, the, yeah. uh, the band? Yeah, yeah. They just released a brand new album. And I found this out this morning. Mm -hmm. They have a song based just on the last two verses of Jude. Oh, what's it called? Um, it is called Unto Him. Oh. I was just binging it this morning and it's so beautiful. Like, oh. you know, just breaking out in praise. And here's why. Because he can present you blameless and faultless and flawless before the glorious presence of God. Mm. So, to me, this is the awesome part about being a Christian. There's hard parts. You got to own sin. You can't get used to it. You can't live in it. You can't continue in it. But here's what Jesus is offering you yeah. that all of the self-care and pep talks of this world, like how could you be like flawless in the sight of God? Yeah. Jesus offers you that and that's our, our hope and our peace. But what about the passage that talks about a person blaspheming the Holy Spirit oh. as being the unforgivable sin? Yeah, you're such a smart Bible lady. No, not always. <laughs> yeah, there is that. So Jesus, what he used the phrase, an unforgivable sin, if you look at the context, though, that's not a person who, like, did something in the past that they felt sorrow for. Yeah. He was speaking to the Pharisees. He's offering them forgiveness and they're saying, you're demon-possessed. So the unforgivable sin is rejecting the Savior who forgives sins. So if the Holy Spirit's working on someone's heart and you're like, no, no Bible, no Jesus. Yeah. Like, yep, that's not going to lead you to a place of heaven. But we're talking today about someone who is like feeling sorrow, repentant in their heart and thinking, am I so bad yeah. that I can't be saved? Totally different. That reminds me of the book of Zechariah. I think it's chapter three where the Joshua, Joshua the high priest is brought before God, yep. the throne of God, and Satan is accusing, just what you said. Yep. Satan yep. is yep. accusing yep. and he's told, you know, take off his dirty, filthy clothes and yeah. put on yes. the bright robes. So if you're panicked, yes. like go to Zechariah three and that's how God feels about it. Yes. I've said this before. One of the coolest parts about being a pastor is we get to do a lot of weddings. And the coolest part about the wedding is not the fried chicken, although that's <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty sweet. <laughs> Gluttony. We'll talk about that in another sermon. It's I'm standing here and I'm next to the groom and the bride walks in and everyone everyone's mm. looking at her. Yeah. And constantly all I do is I look at him and I think, this is how God feels about me. Oh, that's beautiful. Like, Jesus has made me so attractive to God yeah. that he's not like, fine, I'll marry you. He's <laughs> yeah. like choking up. People are choking up because he's choking yeah. up. And I think if that's the way a human being can love someone who looks beautiful, like how can God's perfect heart love someone who is flawless? That's beautiful. Yeah. So just those moments of like, and that's straight from, I think, Isaiah 62, as a groom rejoices over his bride, so will your God rejoice over you. Mm, nice. So, yeah, I mean, the series is, is all about hard words and loving truths. Mm -hmm. And I, I love how we're ending today. Like, here's the truth yeah. that is so full of unconditional love and grace. And it comes right from Jesus and it's ours. Awesome. Great sermon series. Beautiful. Hey, uh, we're super excited. Uh, Amber and I uh, get to write books and we get to promote books. There's a brand new book coming out from Time of Grace. It's actually one of my favorite titles in a long time. It's called True Crimes of the Bible. So if you're a podcaster, um, you probably know that what, 97 of the top 100 <laughs> most popular podcasts are true crimes. Someone's yeah. dying. Well, people died in the Bible too. There's murder, yes. scandal, adultery. And yet our friend Bruce Becker has written a book that talks about those true crimes and then also talks about the shocking grace and hope given to murderers and adulterers like King David, yep. people like Saul who are persecuting Christians. So I think it really gets to the book of Jude's teaching of like sin is bad. Oh, good. But Jesus and his grace are so, so good. Yeah. Hey, Amber, I'm not sure if you know this, but Bruce's new book, True Crimes of the Bible, actually came out of his own podcast, uh, Bible Threads. I do Threads. know that. You I actually know that. listened to it. Yeah, so good. <laughs> it's very good. And actually, uh, when our team at Time of Grace saw like the spot to promote this book, it like grabbed everyone, like I was going to say heartstrings or their headstrings, like <laughs> grabbed our attention from the very first second. So we want you to see that. So take a look. Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out to the field. While they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. David had surrendered himself to his own sinful desires. When word came to David that Bathsheba was pregnant, he hatched a cover-up. Are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, what I did must have become known. Crimes that impact our society today 
are no different than those committed thousands of years ago. Explore some of Scripture's shocking tales of violence, corruption, repentance, and redemption in my new book, True Crimes of the Bible. You'll investigate cases of horrific sin and extravagant grace as you uncover the truth of God's justice, holiness, mercy, and love. True Crimes of the Bible is our way of thanking you for your financial support to reach even more people with the good news of the unrelenting power of God's grace. Request yours today by visiting timeofgrace.org or write us at P.O. Box 301, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, 53201. I told you, that was dope, was it not? (laughs) Make sure you check out timeofgrace.org to find Bruce's book, True Crimes of the Bible. And uh, once again, thanks for joining us this month. We always love your support, your encouragement. If you have any comments, you want to like, share this podcast with someone who needs it. Uh, Maybe someone who's not taking their sin seriously and needs some hard truth from God. Or maybe especially someone who thinks that their sin is so bad that their chances with God are over. Uh, We'd love for you to share this with them so they can find hope in Jesus too. So thanks for being with us again. Amber? Happy to be here. Yeah, awesome. Hope you guys have a great day.